Picture frames. Just about every household has a need for a few picture frames for family portraits or other cherished artwork. For woodworkers, picture frames can be a love-hate kind of project because they contain what could be one of the most challenging types of joinery to cut by hand, the four-corner miter. Furniture moldings typically only require two corners to be mitered because furniture usually only has moldings on three sides. Frames, however, require that all four corners are perfectly mitered, which is a much more difficult task than just mitering two. Professional picture framers have specialized tools that they use to help them cut clean, accurate miters that close very tightly. However, these specialized tools can be expensive to acquire and maintain, and they can take up quite a bit of room. For the occasional frame builder, the cost and space requirements may not be justified. However, good looking frames can still be built by the hobby woodworker using nothing more than our typical home shop tools and a few appliances and aids. Before we can start mitering the molding to make the frame, we need to make the molding. Good moldings start with good stock, plain flat, straight, and square. It's best to make one long piece of molding and cut all of your frame parts from it for the most consistent profile and fit at the corners. However, because the size of the frame I'm building, I need 10 feet of large molding. So I have to make it in two separate pieces and take extra steps to ensure that the profiles are as consistent as possible. With the stock flat and square, I began by planing a rabbit in what will become the back side of the molding. This rabbit is sized to house the painting that will go into the frame. With this rabbit completed, I set up a temporary sticking board to hold the stock while the molding is planed. I'm using really wide boards here only because I plan to reuse them for another project later. The fence is positioned so that the molding stock overhangs the edge of the bottom board just slightly in order to accommodate fenced planes. I attach the fence with double stick carpet tape instead of nails, screws, or glue, again because I plan to reuse these boards for another project at a later date. Because this molding is so large, I also don't need a small, low-profile planing stop like I might for a small furniture molding, so I just used my bench stop. The whole sticking board is held in place on the bench top by a couple of holdfasts. The majority of the molding profile is cut with rabbit planes, so the rabbits are precisely laid out with a marking gauge prior to doing any planing. The dimensions of all the rabbits are scribed on the ends and edges of the stock. The width of only the first rabbit is laid out on the top face of the stock because planing the rabbit would plane away any other width marks that were made. So the width of each subsequent rabbit can be scribed only after the previous rabbit has been planed. I started by planing the rabbit for the molding profile that will form the inside of the frame. This rabbit should really be planed with a sash filister plane because the plane I'm using requires me to plane against the grain here. However, I'll plane enough material away later to remove any tear out, so I'm just taking light cuts against the grain here. The first wide rabbit along the outer edge of the molding is too wide for my moving filister plane to handle. So I started the rabbit with my plow plane, planing almost to full depth. Then I finished sinking the rabbit with my two inch wide unfenced rabbit plane by removing the remaining waste. The width of the next rabbit was then scribed with the marking gauge before being planed with the moving filister. When necessary, the vertical wall of the rabbit was adjusted to proper width using a narrow unfenced rabbit plane laid flat on its side. The process of scribing the width of the next rabbit and planing it to dimension was then repeated until all of the rabbits were planed to proper size. The last rabbit was very narrow, but somewhat deep, so I found it easier to turn the stock on its side and hold it in the vise to plane this final rabbit. 
With all of the rabbets planed precisely to the marking gauge lines, the molding is ready to be shaped with hollows and rounds. The astrical at the top is first, chamfering the ends off close to the final profile with a straight rabbet plane speeds the process. It also saves wear on the harder to sharpen hollow plane. Here a quarter inch radius hollow plane is used to plane off the corners of the chamfer on either side and finish the semicircular profile of the astrical. As mentioned previously, the profile on what will become the inside of the frame needs to be planed in the opposite direction to follow the direction of the grain. Hollows and rounds allow you to do this if you're comfortable planing left-handed. A one and a quarter inch hollow was used to make this profile. As you can see, a sharp blade in a well-tuned molding plane leaves a polished surface that requires no sanding when you have straight grained, well-behaved stock. Unfortunately, as can also be seen, reversing grain can result in some tear out, so this molding will need some light scraping and hand sanding before the finish is applied. The ovular profile of the large cove on what will be the outside of the frame is made with two planes. The tighter part of the curve was made with a one inch radius round plane and the flatter portion of the curve was made with a one and a quarter inch radius round plane. It takes a bit of blending to get these two different circular arcs to approximate an oval shaped profile, but with a bit of practice it's no big deal. To check that the profile between the two separate pieces of molding is close enough for mitering, I use a small gauge made of quarter inch thick wood to check the profile of each stick and adjust where necessary. The profiles don't have to match absolutely perfectly, but they should be close. The miters for the frame can be cut in numerous ways. You can just lay them out with a miter square and saw to the line if you're confident in your sawing abilities. I'll often do this with smaller furniture moldings. Shop made miter blocks and boxes are a great inexpensive alternative to sawing freehand if you're not so trusting in your sawing skills. But by far, the easiest and most accurate sawing method for the small hobby shop is a commercial miter box. These boxes are typically very accurate, both in the horizontal and in the vertical planes. Check the fit on a flat surface like a granite kitchen countertop. I've spaced the parts up here with quarter inch boards in order to be able to easily slide the painting underneath the rabbit. The length of the painting is marked inside the rabbit with a pencil. I add about an eighth of an inch or so to the length to allow for minor adjustment to the miter that will inevitably be required before assembly. The length is then transferred from the inside to the outside edge of the molding using a miter square. Then the molding is sawn to length at the appropriate 45 degree angle. To cut the parallel piece of molding to the exact same length, a simple stop block setup is clamped to the top of the workbench. The first piece of molding is used as a guide to set the position of the stop block, then the parallel piece of molding can be cut to the same length. The stop block is repositioned, and then the process is repeated with the shorter pieces of molding for the sides of the frame. If you're lucky, all four of your miters will close up perfectly tight right off the saw and you can move on to assembly. If your miters come out like mine, however, and one or two of them need a small bit of adjustment, then you still have a bit of work to do. Glue won't hold if the miters don't close tightly, so don't try to assemble the joint if there are any visible gaps. I like to adjust one corner at a time. Check the miter with an accurate miter square. Also check that the cut is plumb with a tri-square. Any visible light means the miter needs adjustment. A white background helps to show any gaps. A miter shooting board is a great way to adjust wide miters like these. The angle and length can be adjusted by the thickness of a plane shaving. Adjust each at a true corner until it checks out with the miter square and tri-square, but be careful that you keep the parallel parts exactly the same length. 
If you adjust one, you'll need to adjust its mate to ensure that both pieces stay identical in length. To assist in assembly, I plane one corner of a large block of wood perfectly square. I only worry about one face, one edge, and one end because that's all I need to be square. Turning again to double-sided carpet tape, I tape the block firmly to the bench top. The square block is an assembly aid. I like to assemble only one corner at a time so I can focus on keeping the corner square while the glue gels. The glue is applied quickly, the two pieces are rubbed together and held firm with their inside edges to the square block to keep the assembled corner square while the glue gels. This takes just a few minutes before I can carefully put that half of the frame aside and then repeat the process with the two opposite pieces for the other corner. After 30 minutes to an hour, I can come back and clean off the large globs of cooled glue with a small scraper or dull chisel. At this point, the glue is not dry, but the squeeze out is cool, soft, and rubbery, and peels away from the wood easily. The remaining glue will be scraped away after the whole frame is assembled. After the glue is fully dried overnight, I reinforce the corner by driving in a cut finish nail into the miter from each side of the joint. The frame is pre-drilled and the nails driven in so that they cross each other and lock the corner together. I drive the nails flush to the surface, but they could also be set below and the holes filled if desired. Assembling the two half frames can be accomplished in several ways. Band clamps work well, as do frame clamps, but an easy and inexpensive way is to use a simple wedge. I nail a couple of wooden cleats to the top of my workbench to act as stops. The last cleat is nailed on so that a wedge can be inserted between the cleat and the frame. By tapping the wedge into place, the miters are clamped firmly closed. Again, I work a single corner at a time. Frequently, the fourth corner may need some final adjustment, so leaving it until last after the other corners are glued makes this possible. So the hot hide glue is quickly applied to the third corner and the frame is fitted between the cleats. With a few taps to the wedge, everything closes up tight and the glue is allowed to dry before moving on to the final corner. If the fourth corner is not closed tightly after gluing the third corner, the fit can still be adjusted using an old carpenter's trick. Wedge the frame into the cleat system on the bench top and use a fine toothed saw to saw through the miter between the two pieces. This removes a small amount of wood from the contacting points between the two half frames and allows the corner to close a little tighter. If the joint doesn't close after sawing through it once, wedge it tighter and saw through it again. After two or three times, the joint should close nice and tight. If you have a thin bladed Japanese saw, you can remove even smaller amounts of wood with each pass. To glue the fourth corner, hot hide glue can be used, but warmed liquid hide glue flows into the joint even better and allows for more working time. I use a small piece of thin wood to work the warmed glue down into the joint and ensure that it covers all the contact surfaces. Then I wedge the frame tightly one last time and wait for the last corner to dry before nailing up the third and fourth corners with more cut nails. To clean up the miters and adjust any uneven joints, I use a combination of tools, including the molding planes used to cut the profile, various chisels and gouges to carve areas even and blend the corners together, and a selection of scrapers to massage the profile and blend one side of the corner into the other. Finally, if necessary, I'll hand sand with 220 grit paper to even out the texture of the frame and remove any remaining small scratches. For the finish, I like to keep it simple. I started by rubbing in a heavy coat of linseed oil, allowing it to thoroughly soak into the wood before wiping off any excess.
After allowing the oil to dry for two to three days, I sealed the piece with six coats of de-wax garnet shellac mixed up from flakes. The quick drying nature of the shellac allowed me to finish all six coats in a single day. After the shellac had dried for two days, I used a gray abrasive pad to knock down the dust nibs and soften the high gloss of the shellac down to a soft satin sheen. Finally, I added a heavy coat of dark brown wax to add age and depth to the finish. After allowing the wax to dry, I buffed out the finish with an old flannel sheet. The final product turned out to be just what the customer had imagined. A beautiful piece of woodwork for a beautiful piece of oil work. And after hanging the frame in its final home, I can officially call this one done.